Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Assessment 3, Signs and Symptoms. I'm actually very fond of this one. This is maybe my favorite part of this because a large part of what I enjoy about being a dietitian is talking to patients and working with them. This, this is a lot of fun to me. Um, we all have our weirdness, you know. I, I'm not here to judge you. Don't, no, no shaming, right? So, a quick note to clinicians, to clinicians, you, um, one of the things I often see when I'm working, especially with interns, is that they're, um, they don't value their own observations very much. And I want to highlight that very quickly. Because what we're doing is actually talking to the patient, we're looking around, we're, we're assessing them, and we're looking at their environment. Any observations you make are important. You are a trained professional. Anything that causes a red flag to you that makes you go, hmm, like dog heard a weird noise, it's it's relevant and it's at least worth noting. It may not be anything, but it might be. You know, at, at very worst, you have done a very thorough examination of the area, made your notes, and it turned out to be nothing. And, and that's fine. You know, if that's what it is, that's fine. Uh, but... Your observations are imp important and valuable diagnostic tools. Don't, don't undervalue those. And look at things as a whole. Again, we're looking holistically at everything. The patient, their environment. Uh, does the patient not feel well? Do they not seem to be responding well? What's their mood like? Are, are they cheerful? Are they depressed? Are they angry? Uh, is there evidence of extra snacking or fluids? Um... In this case, we're looking for things like, are, there, you know, are they telling you that they're not snacking, but you're finding uh, candy wrappers and Coke cans in the trash? That's the kind of thing I'm, that I'm talking about. Anything that's around there that would make you go, hmm, note it. Maybe follow up with somebody else if, they're, if they seem depressed. Follow up with, some, with uh, social services and, and let that person take it from there. So a real mouse, go away. A really quickly here, we've I, I'm sure you've heard this before. We're going to talk signs and symptoms and what they mean, what they are. A sign is an objective, measurable thing, an objective, measurable indicator. It can be noted by somebody outside the patient. It can be measured. We're talking things like uh, temperature, respiration, heart rate, things that you can look at and measure and compare. Uh, a symptom is a subjective, non-observable, non-measurable uh, thing reported by the patient, uh, like pain, nausea. We do not have any way to objectively measure pain outside of the patient. You know, all we can do is say, does it hurt? How badly? That's all we've got. Um, it is worth noting that symptoms are real, if you have a patient that says they're nauseated, they're nauseated. There is zero point in gaslighting them and arguing that no, they're not, whether or not you think that is the case. Just just roll with it because it doesn't do any good to argue that point and it undervalues the patient's input and we don't want that. They are the most important member of the care team. Uh, side note, I, I adore this picture. I I don't know if this is a therapist maybe talking to her client. I don't know. It's a stock photo, you know. She looks so horrified and disgusted by whatever it is that her client is saying. Don't uh, do not do that. If you have a problem with that, work on your poker face. Side note. Anyway, I digress. We go back to this. So you want to ask about things like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, thirst. And you don't have to do this in a clinical kind of checkbox sort of way. And like, are you nauseated? Are you vomiting? Uh, you can do, I try very hard to do a conversational, casual kind of vibe when I'm talking to patients. So uh, what I'll typically do is say something like, how are you feeling? And if they say bad, I'll say, tell, tell me more about that. What's going on? Or if they seem like they're not sure, I'll say something like, have you been feeling sick? Or you know, are you maybe can I say constipated? Is everything working okay? Uh, I don't necessarily want, to, I want this to feel like a casual conversation between people. 
Admittedly, we don't typically talk about our bowel function and how it's going casually, but you know what I mean. Uh, more symptoms. Uh, significant deviations from usual body weight. And this is somewhat a sign and somewhat a symptom uh, because if you're working with somebody in a facility, you have, especially in a long-term facility, a, a rehab, a sniff, uh, something like that, you have some weight history on this person. So you know at least from the time that they got there if they're having some significant deviations or not. Now, you don't know unless they've been there for, you know, if you're working at a long-term care center and you've had this person there for years, then you know. But you don't know right off the bat if this is a usual body weight or not. So that part comes from the patient. Do you know how much you normally weigh? You can look at their clothes and see, do they seem like they don't fit well? That could be an indication of rapid body shift, weight change, words. Uh, but again, this is partially going to be dependent on the history of the patient and your history with that patient. Uh, the other thing you want to check on is changes in uh, dyserexia, which is a change in appetite. Uh, more commonly, it, it's related to its more sexy, well-known cousin, anorexia, which is you know, no bot, no appetite. We'll get to we'll get to this later. Uh, dysgeusia, which is altered tastes. Um, now, side note: I have heard people pronounce this dysgeusia. However, dysgeusia is technically the correct pronunciation of the term. But if you hear someone talk about dysgeusia, now you know that's altered taste. And dysosmia is altered smells. And you can imagine that if you already don't feel well and already there's not a lot of motivation to eat, if the food tastes bad or has no taste to you at all, it's going to be that much harder to get for you to eat. It, it takes a real act of will on, on your part at that point to make yourself eat. And you're doing it because you know you need to, not because you want to. Right? The best way to get somebody eating is to find something they like and to bribe them with the thing they like. And uh, that can, dysgeusia, dysosmia makes that very difficult. So the signs that I look for, and these are all things I do bedside. They're very rapid. They're very easy. I don't break out like tools and uh, calipers and things like that. All of this, again, I'm trying to be very casual. This is what I put together while I'm at the bedside. So we're going to do patient observation, grip strength, thinner space, dorsal hand, shoulder. These are the areas I generally check for lean body mass, edema, lower body strength, and oral mucosa. So step one of this is just patient observation. You know, look at them. Uh, do they look underweight? Do they look overweight? Do they look well nourished also? Because somebody can be at a healthy body weight and still not look well-nourished. And that's, again, that's an important observation to make. And you can put that, you can document that. Yes, they are at a normal body weight. They don't look great. I, I would not use they don't look great, but you know what I mean. Uh, do they look underweight or overweight? Do they seem distracted um, or easily distractible? A lot of patients that are in elder care, you have patients that are developing dementia or have different levels of it. So it can be very hard to get them to focus on even talking to you for a few minutes. It can even be hard for them to focus on eating. So if this is an issue, make note of that. We may have to make some alterations to the environment later to help them eat. Do they seem fatigued? Admittedly, if you're in a care facility, you're probably somewhat fatigued because something's going on. Uh, you wouldn't be there otherwise, right? But what typically what I ask is, are you tired a lot? Do you feel more tired than normal? Do you have energy to get through the day? Or are you having to take breaks in there? Uh, we're looking for, you know, do they have the energy to get through activities of daily living? Are they in pain? Uh, this is, right, pain can take away your will to, to uh, move. It can take away your interest in doing things. It can kill your appetite. Working with chronic pain is very, very difficult. And it's very draining. So ask them that. How do you feel? Do you hurt? Are their eyes glassy or dull? Uh, do they have a Foley? And what does it look like? Not, not what does the Foley look like, obviously. We're not checking that. Uh, what's the drainage? What's the color? Is it clear, amber, straw colored? Uh, is it cloudy? You know, what does it look like? Excuse me a second here. Does it, um, 
are because if it's dark, murky, murky, cloudy, they may be dehydrated. So again, all of this is worth taking in when you go and first see them. Uh, grip strength. Uh, grip strength has for a long time been looked at as a good evaluation of um, mortality and morbidity. I say for a long while because just recently, this has just kind of come up, there has been an argument that grip strength is not is not necessary. It's not necessarily. It's not that it's bad or unhelpful. It's that it's not necessary with a good um, nutrition evaluation. Uh, I do like to do it. I think it does have some uh, diagnostic property there. It's a good uh, indicator of overall lean body mass stores, and there is good evidence in the literature that lean body, or sorry, that grip strength does correlate to mortality, morbidity. Uh, it's a good indicator of how of out potential patient outcomes, but there's also no diagnostic criteria for it. There, there's no at least this many pounds per square inch of grip strength is good. So I can certainly argue both sides of that, and I can see why someone would not want to include that or would not consider it relevant. I, I get it both ways here. I do check it. So what I do is I. If I can get them to, I'll ask them, I'll give them my fingers and say, you know, grab my fingers and don't let me have my fingers back. So you want a little bit, you know, a little bit of a pull. You want some resistance. You're not trying to like, I'll lift them out of the chair they're in, right? Just a little bit of resistance. If they either can't grab your fingers due to, say, arthritis, or if they're having a hard time understanding what you're asking for, you can uh, do a handshake and a handshake will work pretty well for that especially if you have you do a handshake and you give a little squeeze when you're when you're shaking hands the automatic reaction for people is to and squeeze back so that can be a decent indicator if you're having a hard time getting them to do the grip strength the thenar space uh, we're going to palpate the thenar space it should be taut uh, and full and fairly smooth um, this is the thenar space here you're just going to Boy, it's hard to do here. Uh, you're going to just squeeze that. You can feel that while you're holding. If you're shaking their hand or holding their hand, you can kind of palpate that and feel it. Um, any what we're looking for, because remember, there's just here. Eh, there's bone and bone, and then there's just a muscle mass right there. So that's one of the first ones to deplete. Smaller muscles deplete before bigger ones do. Uh, what we don't want is a, now you may not have it be a full pad, it may be just flat, but we don't want it to be depressed or loose skin. That's what we're checking for. And the dorsal hand, there, there are other terms for it. I call it dorsal hand. Um, that's this area here. You can, when you're, when you're shaking hands that person, you can run your thumb across the top of it. It should be full, smooth, and round. Now, Inevitably, when I talk about this, somebody who's like, have got a very slight build, very a very small frame, will go, oh God, I am diminished. What's going on? Uh, the hand bones are fine, right? Hand bones are fine. You can look at my hand here. You can, whoop, dip, there we go. You can see my hand bones in my hand. That's okay. That's, there's very little insurance here on the top. So it's pretty common to see the bones in the hand. What you don't want if you have seen older people, especially that have those deep furrows between the, the bones in the hand, that's what we don't want. This, seeing the bones is fine. We want fullness between the bones. And a handshake can work here as well if they are struggling to let you, to, to understand what you're wanting them to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, edema is the excess collection of fluid and body cavities or tissues. It's important to note for uh, weight history, uh, both because, again, we don't know if we cannot figure out what somebody's usual body weight is, edema is going to throw that off if they admit with edema. Also, it's important to note for weight history because they are going to have, if they come in with edema, they're going to be diuresed and they are going to have a rapid weight fluctuation. And they may have several as they have a diuretic and then the edema comes back and then they go on another round of diuretics. So it could be a fluctuating cycle for a little bit until it gets under control. 
The major three causes for uh, edema are renal failure, cardiac failure, and hepatic failure. And to a degree, where you find the edema is indicative of what's going on. Uh, renal failure typically presents as pedal edema, orbital edema. So in here, you know, pedal edema is the hand, the feet especially, and sometimes the hands. Uh, orbital edema is inside the eye sockets, and facial is just kind of a round, full face. Cardiac failure presents as generalized edema, which uh, is not going to help you very much. Pedal edema again, and pulmonary edema. So that's you're not going to be able to see that. That's interior, uh, internal edema. Uh, blah. Uh, internal edema. There we go. Uh, it's going to present more shortness of breath than anything else. And hepatic failure will present as ascites and pedal edema. So there's, broadly speaking, two types of edema. There's pitting edema, which we see here, which is obvious depressions left in the skin after pressure. If you have never worked with patients with edema, to me... Uh, pitting edema feels a bit like a stress ball. You know, the kind of way you squeeze it. Not, not the really tight stress ball, but the one that kind of feels like it's got wet sand in it or something. You squeeze it, it holds its shape, and it very slowly fills back in. And that's what pitting edema does. You squeeze it, it slowly fills back in. Uh, ideally, right, if you do your check yourself, press, you're going to immediately pop back. Uh, that's that's normal. That's what we want. Pitting edema is is not... Non-pitting edema tends to be, oh, I'm sorry, pitting edema tends to be uh, not painful. Uh, people tend, people with it tend to be aware of it. They don't tend to be, it doesn't hurt them. Uh, Non-pitting edema is uh, no depressions. This is tight. Uh, it's often inflamed and painful. And this one is a, more like a water balloon, like a very tight, full water balloon. It's got a squeezy. Uh, sometimes it'll be weeping if it's really bad. But this one is is unpleasant for people to have people that have it. Lower body strength um, is a good test for lean body mass and overall strength. Uh, the issue here, or what we're checking, is the quadriceps. The quadriceps is the largest single muscle group in the body, unless you count the back as one whole muscle group. And so. A depletion or loss of function in the quadriceps is indicative of overall depletion or loss of function. Uh, this is, in case, come back, mouse. The one time I need you right here on this lady is her quadricep. So the way I check this, and this is one of the reasons, by the way, they hand grip strength is somewhat questioned because this test also will tell you where they are strength-wise. So what I do is put a hand on each knee one at a time on a patient and ask them to try to press up against my hand. Can you pr apply pressure to my hand? Now, again, especially in geriatrics, we are not, remember, working with older people who are a bit frail. So we're not trying to pin them down or hold them there. We're not, this isn't a fight. We just want to see, can you press up against it? Um, weakness may be indicative of sarcopenia or lean body mass wasting. The oral mucosa, we're almost done, I promise. And this really doesn't take that long once you're doing it with patients and you've got it, kind of gotten in a groove on it. Uh, ask them to open their mouth widely. Uh, now, I say this, with uh, patients that have some dementia, uh, it can be very hard for them to understand what you want them to do. So what I will typically do is um, do it for them. Like, can you open your mouth for me? Nah. Can you stick out your tongue? Nah. If you do that, they'll they'll mimic you, um, and that tends to be a lot easier than explaining what you're wanting them to do. So you'll look at their um, that we excuse me. First of all, you want to see can they open their mouth? Um, as you as people either they develop some pain in here or some weakness, they may only be able to open their mouth a few inches. If that's all you can get, it's going to be very hard for them to like say eat a sandwich. So you may have to make some consistency adjustments for the patient to be able to eat well. Uh, you want to look at their mouth, their lips, and their gums. Are they inflamed? Are they pale? Uh, you want to look at their tongue, too. Is it pale or bright red or smooth or cracked? These can be uh, indicative of micronutrient deficiencies, and we'll cover those more in depth later. You also want to look at their teeth. Uh, do they look healthy? Are any cracked, broken, or missing? Few things will impact intake as dramatically as tooth pain. 
And if you have ever had tooth pain, you know, a cavity or a cracked tooth or something like that, it's miserable. And you don't want to do anything to that. You just, no. Few things will impact intake as much as tooth pain. Uh, also, look at dentures. Uh, dentures by themselves are a nutrition intake risk factor. It has been determined that somewhere between 20 and 80% reduction in intake happens with dentures. They're just not as good as teeth. Um, so brush and floss. So you look at your dentures. Do they have dentures? Do they fit? You know, are you, when you talk to them, do you see or do you hear whistling or that kind of clacking? If you ever heard somebody with loose dentures, the teeth will kind of click because they're not sealed to the gums well. Um, and again, just generally ask them, do, do you have trouble eating? Are things difficult? Do you, are there things you find that are hard to eat? Uh, things you try to avoid, like, you know, I don't know, carrots, celery, uh, large pieces of meat. D check on that. Ask how they're doing. Dehydration. Uh, you do de the, um, the bedside dehydration test is uh, skin turgor, which is the elasticity of the skin. This is typically done with the pinch test, which is, you know, if you look here, boop, do a pinch, lift it a little bit. And it should snap back into place. That, that's what we want. Uh, if you have somebody that's dehydrated, you may have them, uh, the skin may stay there. It may hold, stay up or it may kind of fall over, but it doesn't snap back into place. Um, now you can see the picture here. I don't love this picture because this person really looks like they're doing a vigorous pinch. Uh, ee, that looks unpleasant. That looks painful to me. I, I don't recommend that. This is typically done on the dorsal hand. Um... I use the anterior forearm because I'm also we're working with older patients. Skin tears are a real risk, and I don't want to be responsible for one. So I will check on the anterior of the arm. It is not nearly as good as the dorsal hand, but it does eliminate or at least reduce skin tear risks, and I don't want to be the one that causes that. And fingernails are like, you know, they're like human growth rings. Uh, deformities can be indicative of malnutrition, um, typically it's a protein malnutrition or maybe a micronutrient deficiency, but they're nonspecific by themselves. Uh, plenty of other things can cause nail, nail deformities, such as a trauma to the finger or the nail, nail bed itself. Um, some disease states can cause it. So we have, you know, as examples, here's beating, ridging, and spooning, and, uh, you know, here we also have canals, bows lines. So example, like I said earlier, uh, some comorbidities can cause a fingernail malformations, I guess. Uh, you know, diabetes, hepatic disease, thyroid dysfunction are just some examples. So you can't just look at somebody's fingernails and go, aha, protein. Uh, that's not enough by itself. Uh, protein, to, the other, the last one is hair. Excuse me, I kind of got out of order there. Uh, People, or I'm sorry, diagnostic tools, there we go, often recommend checking hair as a, to check on protein depletion. Uh, and, and it does do that. Protein depletion will cause hair to uh, shed uh, because your body's a living thing. If resources become scarce, it starts moving function from things that it doesn't consider important to things it does consider important, like keeping you alive. Uh, hair is a not important function, so it will take resources away. Hair can become uh, thin, brittle, dull, or start falling out if uh, during severe protein depletion. I don't tend to use this because it's not very diagnostic in the elderly population. Um, the issue is that by that men, 85% of men over 50 and 40% of women over 40 will have at least thinning hair by that point. Uh, and as we mentioned earlier, that's all of geriatrics is over 40 or over 50. So it's a very high likelihood that the person you're looking at is going to have thinning hair just on, by virtue of oldness. So I don't tend to look at hair at all. It is something that comes up and something I think should be mentioned, but I, I don't put a lot of weight in it. All right. That's, that is signs and symptoms. This is a wrap here. 
your observations are important. Note them and follow up. It may turn out to be nothing, but nobody ever got harmed by doing more but more more documentation, more research on a, on a patient than um, was strictly speaking necessary. Physical signs and symptoms are a key to understanding nutritional status. And again, never use one piece of evidence to make a, diag a nutrition diagnosis. All right, that is signs and symptoms. I will catch you again in the next one, and we'll talk about intake and documentation. You guys have a great day. Talk to you later. Bye.